Good morning, my name is Joanne Milner and I am the Education Partnership Coordinator uh, in the Office of Mayor for Salt Lake City. We are very pleased to welcome you to the Mayor's Data Summit, Carpe Datum, Seize the Data. And we hope that uh, you will find this very uh, valuable information for you and what you do in our community. Upon entering the auditorium, you should have received a program and inside uh, an index card, two index cards, a white one and a yellow one, along with a pencil. We hope that you will write on that white card uh, your question as we go, we will have an opportunity to have a, an activity for question and answers and on the yellow card comments if you don't want to ask a, a question of the panel or any other, the other presentations but that you would like to leave a comment, we ask that you do that on the yellow card. In addition, um, as was mentioned to you in the invitation, we have available for purchase um, the Atlas, the Salt Lake City Census 2010 Atlas, both the uh, hard copy as well as a CD. You can buy them together or independently. $35 for the book and $5 for the disc. You can purchase that uh, on the outside of the auditorium there at the registration desk. We have uh, Britta from the Salt Lake Education Foundation that will be able to do that. As we're um, respectful of your time, we will follow the um, outline program. We're a little late in getting started, but we will keep to that so that we have the adjournment on, on time. And uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our uh, honorable mayor, of our capital city, uh, Mayor Ralph Becker, and uh, we will turn the time over to him. Thank you. Joanne, uh, thank you as always. I think all of you know that <coughs> Joanne, from the time, <coughs> excuse me, from the time that I started uh, in office, uh, thanks to a partnership with the Salt Lake City School District, uh, has uh, been an education coordinator for Salt Lake City, and it is the first time, uh, as far as I know, that the city has become directly and intensively involved in playing a role to actively support uh, public education and our educational opportunities in Salt Lake City. And it really came about um, through a recognition that I certainly developed over the years in the state legislature that in Salt Lake City, uh, as is true throughout our public education system, but particularly in Salt Lake City, that we were not meeting the needs uh, of our kids. And uh, as I was uh, looking at running for mayor and things that I thought would be important, uh, I viewed uh, looking at what the city can do to support public education, and I look at Mikkel Withers here because we've had sort of an ongoing joke about what that means, um, that it was, it was really of utmost important that if we're gonna be successful as a city and as a capital city, that we needed to do what the state was not doing, uh, which is really to recognize the differences that we have in Salt Lake City, uh, the needs we have in Salt Lake City for our kids, um, and to find ways to strengthen our educational opportunities for our kids so that they can be successful and our community is, is obviously healthier as a result. And I think w uh, thanks in large part to the work of Joanne and the kind of ongoing and increasing commitment I think we're making in Salt Lake City, hopefully we're moving in that, uh, in that direction. Um, uh, Salt Lake City has been uh, really fortunate to be the recipient um, of a program that is going on nationally, the Post-Secondary Success City Action Network, PSCAN, uh, through the National League of Cities. Um, and I think we've all benefited, the city side and the s school side, uh, from both additional resources and maybe most importantly through some expertise and uh, gleaning the benefits of what we see going on and are, are things that could happen from experiences all around the country and how we uniquely apply um, that knowledge and that assistance to our Salt Lake City schools and to educational opportunity. And uh, you'll be reviewing a lot of that with Capital City 
education program, I know, and most of you are very familiar with that, I think, to begin with. Um, but today, um, we're focusing on one element of that, and that, of course, is the data piece of this. Um, and uh, one of the things that we all know is that for us to both understand and measure success and measure what is successful uh, in, in the uh, approaches that we take to, uh, to provide greater educational opportunities and improve those, uh, we've got to be able to analyze well what is happening uh, in terms of achievement, in terms of success, in terms of keeping kids in school and working their way uh, through school and through all their educational opportunities. And so this, uh, this forum today and discussion today and the outcomes of today really go a long way towards us being able to really quantify well what we're doing. Uh, we're fortunate that uh, Kyle Lamafa on our city council is here and He's a data dude, um, and so we'll be, uh, we'll be able to have sort of some extra benefit and expertise in the city um, because of that. Um, but I'm also, we're also really fortunate with the work of, um, of the Bureau of Economic and Business Research, BEBR, at the, uh, at the University of Utah for the work that they have done um, with uh, with producing a census uh, atlas and with really looking in much more detail at information um, in our city. Uh, I was mentioning to Dr. Perlick as we were getting going here that I've, I uh, keep that um, book at home because as I get free time and think about things, uh, it's, it's an incredible resource for us uh, in our community to both understand who we are uh, but also identify where we need to go. So the data obviously enables us to, uh, to create some new connections. Um, it weaves, uh, excuse me, a lot of the threads that, uh, that, we, that we need to tie, uh, tie ourselves together in terms of our educational opportunities. Um, and I'm really hopeful and fully expecting that the outcomes of today's work with all of you and with the panels that we'll be uh, having here um, are really going to help us advance uh, both our capacity and what we're able to achieve and hopefully serve um, as a model, as I think is reflected to a certain extent around the country, for a way that we're doing things in Salt Lake uh, to bridge the achievement gap, uh, to keep kids in school, uh, to provide for learning opportunities and lifelong learning that really uh, centers in the cultivation model that we have around, uh, around the family. And uh, obviously an awful lot of things are happening there. So before uh, introducing our key presenter here, um, I want to um, acknowledge um, the work that's been done uh, by an intern in our office, Darius Lee, who's a graduate uh, from Harvard and has been assisting us with our Capital City Education Program. So I want to thank you for that work, um, Darius, and, uh, and hope you'll continue working with us uh, in the future, um, which you will be doing because Dr. Perlick has brought her on board um, as part of her team. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing someone everyone knows here and is increasingly and well known around the state, and that's Dr. Pam Perlick, who heads up um, the University of Utah's uh, Bureau of Economic and Business Research and is director of the Utah Community Data Project. Um, most importantly, as it relates to this project, though, uh, she is the leading data diva uh, among, uh, among people who have been working on our education information. So Pam, thank you for joining us, and I'm looking forward to, as I know all of us are, uh, the outcomes of the discussion today. So thank you. It's so great to be able to share a part of the morning with you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for supporting us in our work. And we look forward to the work we have to do together into the future. So carpe datum, data dudes, embrace your data dude. Data divas, embrace your inner data diva. 
So I think we recognize that we live in extraordinary times, that we are witnesses to and participants in a great cultural and economic and demographic and technological transformation that is impacting so all of our lives in many ways. It's very broad in scope. It has extraordinary uh, implications for how we do business, how we connect to each other. We may not really recognize the fact that what's driving these changes, these phenomenal changes that are, by the way, irreversible, cumulative, and ongoing. But the, what's driving these changes are really changes in connections between people, although they may be mediated by markets. We are all much more connected, inextricably connected, and intimately connected than ever before and globally by labor markets and product markets and financial markets. We're also much more connected to each other and to people globally because of information technology, because of the way that technology is allowing us to instantaneously connect, but also the opportunity that it affords us to analyze uh, and to uh, mine data and to leverage it into new understandings about how we do things. This new technology at once is a motivator, it's an enabler, it brings us the opportunity to do so much more than we have in the past, but it also renders old ways of doing things uh, in, uh, obsolete in the face of these new changes. It offers both opportunities and incentives to change. But really it's the connections we have with new people and new cultures as we have this great wave of immigration to our nation and to our community and the children of these new immigrants who bring to us new intellectual and cultural and linguistic traditions, and so there is this combination of this great new generation, we call them millennials, the first minority majority generation, which is in so much in tune with this new technology in ways that us old white baby boomers are only barely able to glimpse, but they lead the way for us. This is indeed a generational shift. And to understand the potential that we have as we reach across the generations, as we listen and learn from our elders and from our children, as we listen and learn across cultures in authentic relationships where we're not just teaching but we're learning and we're trusting the ideas, the insights, and the capability of this mighty new millennial generation, which by the way, is larger now than the baby boom generation. Births in 2008 exceeded births in 1957. Well, we can see at a broad scale these changes when we look at demographic data. And in the demographic data, we can see that minority shares of the population were very small until about the 1980s. And then with the coming of the immigrants, we see this great increase in diversity in our nation this pink line right here is Salt Lake City, which you see is right on pace with the nation. And by the time we old baby boom boomers begin to die off, what happens is that the, the nation becomes minority majority, as does the community. We're about a generation and a half behind in the state as a whole, but Salt Lake City is on pace with this great generational shift in diversity. And we can see that this is articulated very differently in different geographic areas. What this graph shows you are minority shares of the population by age groups and by five-year age groups for different places. So five, zero to five, that's preschool, five through nine, 10 through 14, and so on, and top-coded 85 years and older. And so what this shows us that is in Utah, one out of four preschoolers is a minority kid, in Salt Lake County, 35% of preschoolers are minority kids. In the nation, 49% of preschool age kids are minority. In Salt Lake City, half of the preschoolers are minority kids. And in the River District of Salt Lake City, 80% of the youth are minority kids. And so we have this incredible geographic variation in how these these uh, irreversible and important transformations are occurring, it's happening very differently across neighborhoods. 
So the micro scale, scale data is not the same as the macro scale data. And we know averages are just that, averages. Nobody's the average. Life happens in the details. And the distribution is all that is important. The message is not the median. The message is the, the distribution and understanding this, these variations. The problem, of course, is that in the age of digitization, the amount of data that's being produced every day is phenomenal. And old practices in mining and understanding data simply are not up to uh, the challenge of this absolute avalanche of data. But this avalanche of data also provides the opportunity if technology and, and mathematical techniques are appropriately applied to understand reality in ways we've never been able to in the past. Neighborhood data now becomes extremely important in understanding how the changes are occurring and what these changes mean for the future. Life happens in neighborhoods. Life does not happen in averages. And so it's essential to understand the new ideas and the new places and the new people and the new opportunities to understand what happens in neighborhoods. So community level data uh, is in very high demand by a wide variety of institutions and of course uh, universities and cities and uh, all organizations need these kinds of data. Home builders and market analysis and home building reminds me of Jim Wood, who is the director of the Bureau of Economic and Business Research. Mayor, thank you for the promotion, but my boss and my director are sitting right there. Hi, Jim. Uh, and home building and home data is a big part of our system that we're wanting to, wanting to uh, implement. Well, since this 2010 came, and for all of us who are uh, data divas and data dudes, oh, we looked so forward to it. Uh, and maybe you'll remember in the promotional materials they talked about 10 minutes. 10 questions, and you're thinking, wow, where did all those other questions go? Uh, what about all those questions about occupation and nativity and language? Where did, where did they all go? Well, they weren't there. Uh, all we have from Census 2010, as wonderful as that data is, uh, account of people by age, sex, race, ethnicity. And then we have households, either the people who live together and their relationships, housing units. Those are the structures people live in. Uh, whether they are occupied or vacant, rented or owned, and group quarter population. These are people who live in correctional facilities or dormitories. There are some, some similarities there. Uh, and, and also as skilled nursing facilities. Uh, and that's all we got. Um, the long form's gone. We lost the long form. And in its place, what we, and we had it actually since 1790, in its place, uh, we have what is called the American Community Survey. Uh, this is um, the train wreck at Lookout Mountain Tunnel, uh, May 16th of 1907. And this is the American Community Survey for neighborhood level data. Now at higher levels of geography where you have larger sample sizes, this survey can create data that is worthwhile and valuable. But when you drill down into the neighborhood level, uh, what you have to do is accumulate five years of data of monthly data to get information on neighborhoods. And you tell me, what does it mean, the poverty rate in a neighborhood for 2007, 8, 9, 10, and 11? 60 observations. And nothing, by the way, was happening in the economy at that time. Uh, and so it really becomes not only this, the fact that the samples are so small, but conceptually, this is not the kind of data that can motivate and inform our policies and understandings with uh, the small geography and with the small populations. And now my valued colleague, uh, Rosie Hunter, who runs the University Neighbor Partners, uh, asked me if uh, I could look into the number of Somalians in her census tract where, her, uh, where she's located. And this was the data that we found from the American Community Survey. It's estimated between 109 Somalians, plus or minus 119. Uh, what this means is that there's a 90% probability that there are between minus 9 and 228 Somalians. Now, I think we understand that this point estimate is worthless. Uh, so who else do we lose in the loss of the long form? Well, educational uh, attendance, language, uh, disability, uh, changes in homes, commuting, occupations, 
frail elderly, wealth, moving, commuting, and graduation, uh, and then veteran status, foreclosure status, and of course the homeless. At the neighborhood level, these people are all invisible. We have lost them. We have no data for them. Uh, you can talk about averages at the state, but we cannot locate these populations within neighborhoods. And this is the way that the data is presented. And so you'll love this. So if we look at the um, native-born population that is born outside of the United States, glad they had that for us, um, zero. Um, but you can see that the confidence intervals here are rendering the data useless and not to mention confusing. So what are the options that we have? And there are a lot of people who are just saying, well, let's just use that data and not report the confidence intervals uh, when the data is, is uh, not correct, when the data is not accurate. There are many people who are doing that. Uh, there are other people who are using, making up data, building synthetic data, applying uh, mathematical techniques and statistical techniques where they're taking data that is true for large areas and in effect applying it to smaller areas. This is, this is not correct either because you're applying averages that are not uh, occurring in the neighborhoods. And so what we propose as an alternative and like we're not like pioneers in this area are to build independent estimates using other data sets, administrative data sets that were created for other purposes but applying them to our neighborhood portraits to understand how the conditions are changing. Let's look at Salt Lake City here for just a second. This is the River District. This is the data in 2000. This is minority shares of the population. And now look how that area changes so significantly in 10 years. Uh, so this, and yet, in, on the east side of Salt Lake City, very little uh, ethnic minority population. And that is over the span of 10 years. And we also need data for 2011, and 2012, and 2013, and 2014. This is the work of population estimation. And that's part of our proposed program of two, as we want to develop these metrics and update them year by year so you don't wait every 10 years to get, get the, the changes that are occurring. So this administrative data, here's an example. Uh, these, this is the assessor's data. This shows you where affordable housing is, and it highly correlates where the new populations are locating because that's where they can afford to live. Here's school data from the Salt Lake City School District. This shows you the free and reduced lunches uh, participation on the River District is very high and not so much on the east side. This is an indicator of socioeconomic status. Oh, there are the Somalians, and I'll bet where we have these uh, 18 kids here and 10 kids here, they have families, moms and dads and grandpas and grandmas. So this can become an indicator of foreign-born population. This is languages spoken at home, non-English non speaking, English speaking. And so you see we repurpose data uh, from a lot of other sources, like from workforce services or the Department of Health or from education. And of course, this requires all kinds of data agreements, protections of confidentiality, FERPA and HEPA and all that stuff that sounds like a cat coughing. Um, and we, but we want to build it into a data system. Uh, and we're not the first people to do this. In fact, we're way behind the curve. And it's unfortunate, especially for our capital city. See, we want to build our, our system out statewide. But we really want to build a system to serve our capital city. Uh, that we're flying so blind now. Uh, on these small area metrics that we don't understand the changes that are occurring. Look, they're ahead of us. The National Neighborhood Indicator Partners will hear from representatives of them later today. Uh, here we are in Indiana. They have a system. Here we are in New Orleans. They have a system. Uh, and so the importance of this system for, uh, for, under, for the connection to our capital city education, uh, Darius, our colleague at the University of Utah will uh, explain for us. Thank you, Dr. Perlick. Um, good morning. So um, as you probably know, um, Salt Lake City School District was selected as one of only 61 finalists in last year's Race to the Top grant competition. And this would not have been possible without the leadership of Superintendent Withers and the phenomenal data staff led by Joellen and Christine and the Salt Lake Education Foundation. And so we've work through this grant under the construct of a capital city education, this cross-institutional collaboration. Um, and so 
despite reaching finalist status, we eventually did not receive one of the 20 to $30 million grants. So we went back and analyzed the technical review form and found out that 35% of the point deductions were due to data. And some of the judge comments were that they wanted to see the education baselines and indicators in the context of neighborhood level data, housing, transportation, and health. Um, however, this is really beyond the purview of any school district. And this really is indicative of the fact that these judges are looking to see real cross-institutional collaboration on data. And in addition to the partnerships, the judges noted that they applauded the efforts of a capital city education, uh, but they worry about the sustainability of this partnership due to the lack of seed funding and ongoing investment. And so community, community level data and partnership sustainability are two areas in which the point deductions would have covered the 14 additional points needed to win the 20 to $30 million. So this is, we are very close, but we, we really need the, the help and the effort from the community in helping us fill that gap. Um, so we also did an analysis of Promise Neighborhoods, which is a half a million dollar grant. And in this grant, we found out that half of the point deductions were due to data. And some of the data specific reasons were the fact that the judges applauded the district for its superior ability to disaggregate data by schools. And I should say the district is always lauded for having the most superior data system in the state, and there's no doubt about that. Uh, but the, the judges are not only looking at dis disaggregation by schools, but also disaggregation by the neighborhoods in which these students live. And again, that is way beyond the purview of any school district. And in addition, one judge even stated that using state level data is, is not sufficient to describe the severity of the needs and issues in the River District neighborhood. And so we really need to show these judges that we're able to understand our neighborhoods from a quantifiable standpoint. And in addition, the same themes reoccur. Um, if you look at the other point deductions, most of those are due to partnership sustainability. Again, they, they worry about the sustainability due to the lack of funding from our community. And it really is a catch-22 because we are working together in the construct of a capital city education to win these grants to provide that seed funding, but it seems like the judges want to see some vested interest from our community from the outset. And so as we're working towards these collaborations, Dr. Perlick is consolidating a lot of community-level community data in uh, demographics, housing, transportation, and health. And so we're starting to conceptualize ways in which we can help different community institutions in solving this issue of community-level data. And this is just one case study in education, but this can be applicable to any institution or discipline or industry. And in this case, we're trying to think of ways in which we can provide value added to school districts in linking their school and out-of-school time data with community-level data, so that as they're working on their grant applications, they have that community-level data right at their fingertips. And as we start to win these grant applications, we'll, we'll need these um, community level indicators to fulfill those grant requirements. So the district has done everything it possibly can to maximize its scores in these grant applications. Now the remaining points require a concerted effort on the part of our community to make that investment in the Utah Community Data Project and a capital city education so that we have a community level data system and sustainability and community partnerships so that we can serve our youth in our capital city. Thank you, and I'll, and I'll turn the floor back over to Dr. Perlick. <laughs> that was great, Darius. Thank you. So there you have it, and the researchers everywhere understand that neighborhood data is sorely lacking now. And neighborhood data, over time, is what we need to understand how these times are so very different, that one policy doesn't work for all communities, that one program doesn't work for all communities, and that the angel really is in the details. We need this neighborhood data system. It's not just about data, of course. It's about a whole research agenda that focuses on the changing conditions, that cross-correlates data across many dimensions. And we track this across time. So where we deploy new programs, policies, and resources, we track across time. What are the metrics that change? What are the community indicators that change or don't? So as we think about 
uh, this information at system that we're building, this research program we are building, it's not just a technical exercise. It is, in a tangible way, connecting people and ideas and possibilities. And again, it is the embrace of these new technologies that are sometimes very mysterious for, for some of us older baby boomers, but are so clear to this new millennial generation, this cross-generational uh, collaboration, this cross-cultural a gener gen uh, a collaboration which allows us to unleash the power of uh, technology to mine this data, to visualize this data, to build metrics that are meaningful, to design policies that are appropriate for this new day that we're living in. We want to do this as a public good. We are hoping to democratize data. Thank you very much. Mike's all on. Um, hi, my name is Judith Oki, and I'm going to be moderating this panel of uh, very distinguished people from among, around the city who have great opportunities to help us understand how to better access and use and what the power of this neighborhood level data might be. Um, to the far left, I'm just going to start on the far left, and, and you may know many of these people, is Karen Crompton. Karen is the executive director of Voices for Utah, Utah's Children. Natalie Gochner is not a stranger to anybody in this room, I'm sure. She has held many hats and is currently the Associate Dean of the University of Utah's College of Business. Kyle LaMalfa is the Chairman of the Salt Lake City Council, and uh, Mikkel Withers is the Superintendent of the Salt Lake City School District. Chris Redgrave is a business representative from Zions Bank. Um, Cynthia, uh, Cynthia, <laughs> Cynthia Talbot is here as a co-facilitator. Cynthia is going to help us keep track of the time, and she'll give us a, a, a signal at about the two-minute point. Part of what we want to do here, and we're going to start with we're going to start with Natalie, is to just hear some responses from the perspectives that each of these individuals represent to this notion of community and neighborhood-level data. Natalie, great. Thank you, Judith. Uh, thank you, Dr. Perlick. Great presentation. I know I uh, speak on behalf of this group when I say thank you for all the great work you're doing. It's, it's really wonderful. I'm, I'm here today to represent Prosperity 2020, which is the state's largest business-led uh, education movement. Uh, our goal is to in improve the accountability, investment, and innovation in Utah's education system. And I guess I qualify as a data diva because I was asked to be here and Prosperity 2020 needs data. And, and so it's, it's my pleasure to be here. After this last legislative session, uh, President uh, Niederhauser was asked about Prosperity 2020. And he said, you know, Prosperity 2020 has successfully made supporting education politically popular in our state. I like to think that's progress. But we need to be more than popular. Uh, we need to make correct decisions. And that's why today's uh, CARPA Datum conference is so important. The business leaders that I work with care deeply about education in Utah. They've worked for four years to make progress. And for the first time, our state has aligned the State Office of Education, the Board of Regents, the Governor's Office, his commission, the legislature, the business community, we've aligned behind a single goal, and that is to have 66% of Utah's adult population with a post-secondary degree or certificate. So we've defined true north, and we're actively trying to get on that northbound train that gets us there. But there's an issue, and there's a problem, and I wanna tell you a little story. Um, I'm, I'm of the age, uh, some of us on the panel are of the age where seeing uh, things to read, you know, you have to start doing this. And uh, I started to notice about two years ago that I was not seeing clearly. 
And I wear contacts, and I was seeing the horizon just fine, but I wasn't seeing up close very well at all. And it takes you a while as you age to kind of get used to the fact that you've got a problem. <laughs> the people that have this problem will know what I'm talking about. But I started to make serious mistakes. I would go to a restaurant, and I'd get the restaurant bill, and I would tip unfairly or too graciously because I couldn't read the data. Uh, I had a really unfortunate situation where I read a footnote. And those of you that have this problem know what I mean. You confuse fives and sixes. They're hard to see that fine print. And uh, I, pub I published something where I got the footnote wrong and took heat for it. And it had nothing to do with my, you know, incompetence. It had to do with my vision. Um, I could see the horizon, but I missed the fine print. I saw the macro. I missed the micro. And uh, I started reading about multifocal contact lenses. I don't know if any of you wear them, but they changed everything for me. Because now I can see not only the horizon, but I can see the fine print, and I don't have to bungle with reading glasses. Well, I'd like to compare the Utah Community Data Project to multifocal lenses. That is, they're a game changer. Without community level data, we see through a glass darkly. We see the horizon, but we miss the detail. And if I can bring it back to education, in order to reach our 66% goal, we need to know what's happening at the community level. We're never going to have the right policies if we don't have accurate, timely, community level data. So I join a group of panelists up here to say that uh, I believe our future is not a gift, but an achievement. We will create a prosperous future, but not by accident, but by careful and purposeful decision making on behalf of Prosperity 2020 and the business leaders that I work with, I thank the mayor, I thank Dr. Perlick and her team. This is the right vision at the right time. We need multifocal lenses. Let's keep Utah prosperous for future generations and support the Utah Community Data Project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natalie. I just I want to remind people to keep jotting down your questions and we'll collect those um, in a few minutes. Uh, Superintendent Withers, would you like to go next? Sure. I'm the undistinguished member of the panel, so uh, <laughs> we'll get me out of the way and then we can have the rest of the panel uh, fill in. Um, community level data for schools is critical at so many fronts. If you haven't had a chance to see the diversity in our schools, we welcome you to come visit. The whole world is gathered in the schools in Salt Lake City. Um, there are over 100 different languages spoken by young people and their parents. Um, that grows as you include dialects. And so that diversity that uh, Dr. Perlick shared with you is a net advantage when you understand what that enables a community and a population to do. So as we've worked real hard, as you heard, to be able to have data to help inform teachers, teachers are vulnerable to people misusing data or misapplying emphasis to that or not understanding some of the nuances uh, that are necessary to be able to inform practice and improve practice to help young people learn and grow in a way that is productive and possible uh, for them. But the barriers that they have, sometimes we talk about achievement gaps and sometimes those are really opportunity gaps. Sometimes they're experience gaps. Sometimes they're resource gaps. And the better data you have for the community that surrounds the school, the more likely you are to be able to break down those barriers and help young people succeed, help break the cycle of poverty, help be able to empower a school in a much different way. So we try to bridge that through what are called community learning centers, where we try to uh, leverage and bring together as many different agencies as possible strategically with the right data to then focus on removing real barriers rather than perceived barriers. Because sometimes there are people that want to do good work and they have funding for good work and they put it in the wrong neighborhood or at the wrong age level or with the wrong population. And the smarter we are at being able to compare what we know and what we know will work and then leverage one another's efforts and get away from the turfism that people fall into, the more young people will be able to help. And so as we've seen some evidence of how powerful that is, as we get smarter about that and being able to 
to leverage not only resources, but time, energy, and focus with kids, you'll see some simple things. So two quick examples, because you haven't held my two-minute card up yet, so, <laughs> okay, I'm good. So two real quick examples um, that relate to that. After-school programs have happened across the country for a long, long time, and they range in perception from just being anything from childcare to being connected with the day program. But if you're not thinking about the academic mission of the day school and how the afternoon school either supports or relates to that, it's a missed opportunity. So often people just approach that whole task of caring for young people rather than engaging them in potentially learning activities that support their activities during the day so that they have a net benefit from that time after school. Same thing with summer schools, same thing with uh, access to technology and so forth. So as we become smarter in sharing that kind of data, how do you have a day school employee overlap into the afternoon school so they both know the student and the learning need in ways that break down those barriers? So that's one simple example. And then you get some aha moments. So a year ago, during the legislative session, we tried to reach out and educate our community about uh, where particular bills are that might be helpful to the schools and those that might not be so helpful and how they can then provide feedback to their elected leaders. And so we had one of those scheduled on the east side of the school district and one scheduled on the west side of the district. On the east side of the district, as we talked through the bills, the numbering, the priorities, the how those priorities related to the bills that are currently out there, how economics might face the schools, uh, those in attendance um, understood the language of the bills and how to potentially write a letter to or send a phone call in or an email to their elected leader to try and influence yeses and nos on particular bills. As we went out to uh, our West Side community, uh, we translated the interaction, but it came to me in a heartbeat as I was trying to share the same information that what we were missing was actually some time being spent on how the whole system works of developing bills. So instead of talking about specific bills, it turned into, let's talk about our three forms of government and representative government and who represents you in your community, how do you get voice in that process, and what happens next to be able to invest in the lives of your kids. So it's the outcome in the next couple of days after these meetings that I want to talk about. So on the east side, I'm sure that a couple of emails and phone calls were made. On the west side, the Parents United got together, went up to the Capitol to meet their elected leader and talk about their kids and the investments in the community. We have to be smarter about sharing good information, connecting people with the data and information so that they can move forward and resist people that do, as you heard from Dr. Pamlik, misuse data either for a political agenda or to try and block investments that otherwise would pay off dividends for uh, underrepresented and or people that don't have as loud a voice as they ought to have. If we're gonna break the cycle of poverty, um, we have to think about open access to public education that creates opportunities that young people haven't had previously. Our country is great because you can do it over. You can make a mistake and do it again. You can get help when others don't see it. Our productivity, this is a, a hilarious comment and then I'll quit, um, uh, that I heard just in the, the past month about uh, the 30th anniversary of A Nation at Risk and that the country was at risk because of the public schools and the lack of helping prepare kids for our economy. The greatest productivity in this country was from 1986 through 2008 after the Nation at Risk report up until the financial collapse in 2008. And those were public school kids that uh, were involved in that productivity. The presenter then talked about, now what happened in 2008 and that collapse? He said, I'm pretty sure those were all private school educated individuals that <laughs> collapsed the economy in this country. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. So we've looked at this, we've, we've seen kind of how this works that can work at the state level and specifically in the education sector. And now, Kyle, would you like to talk a little bit about how this works in other sectors sort of citywide? Sure. Um, I'll talk just a little bit about a perspective from the city council. I think I can speak for the city council um, when I say that council members want to make good decisions. Uh, we don't want to make bad decisions. And um, uh, mostly what we receive at the council level are uh, packets and reports that have that have been chewed over by teams of consultants for making lots of money um, 
and working through lots of different pieces of information. We're now empowered, I suppose, to ask questions about the chain of custody of information and make sure that the data that they are using to make decisions um, is trustworthy, that it comes at the, at the root, it, it is high quality. We also ask questions when we make decisions about the redundancy of the information and to make sure that, that the different pieces of, of different, from different sources are saying, telling a similar story. And as policymakers, we are willing to make courageous decisions if it's based on sound information. The, I would say the rise of um, this data-driven culture has also given rise to citizen participation. Uh, and so data for policy planning must also be citizen-oriented to some perspective. Oftentimes, <clears throat> the main question I get from uh, constituents about the decisions we make is basically, why are you so stupid? <laughs> but when we can demonstrate transparency, uh, that we're not hiding something, when we can demonstrate uh, credibility in terms of that a citizen would reach the same conclusion based on the same information. Um, when the process is participatory, then we get legitimacy and, um, and we mollify the, chair, the, the notion that we're cherry picking the data. Uh, in this you know, project of uh, the, the, the data project of PAMS, Salt Lake City is probably one of the, pri one of the primary suppliers of these, these administrative databases. And, and I'll just list a few of them that we're currently supplying right now. You can go out on data.slc.gov and you can uh, take a look at this information for yourself. But we have calls for police service, crime incidents, lists about our parking system, planning permits, our entire payroll is published online, uh, the entire city revenue and, and expenses, lists of our sidewalks and crosswalks, our building inspections and our building licenses are all published online. And that government data is being used to empower people in certain ways. I don't, uh, if you've ever heard of um, mashups, uh, that citizens have gone and and looked at some of this data and they've identified food deserts, places where business licenses for uh, food uh, services are, don't match up with the, um, the data that says for population. So when the ratio's off, it comes from two different databases, but we know we, have, we may have a, a food desert there. Another uh, mashup is a walkability index. There's a neat website online. You can go and, and look and see your house and see how it compares in terms of how walkable it is to other businesses. Well, that, that requires data, real estate data, it requires business license data, it requires all kinds of things to be mashed up and pushed together. The other uh, sort of trend that we're seeing in using the data is this, uh, or these apps for your, for, your, for your smartphone, where people maybe put a bus schedule app, or I've got a police scanner app for my my iPhone so I can listen to what's going on on police scanner. And people have found value in this information because they're selling ads and people are willing, you know, they can make money on our, on our government data. Um, a couple other things I just want to add about, about the, the importance of the data is that as we imagine the future, uh, we have a, we have a, organization, a local regional organization called Wasatch 2040, who thinks that Salt Lake City is going to add about 60,000 people over the next 25 years. And that's about 2,000 people a year, a little more than that. I don't know if anybody of you have been through Sugar House lately, but there's a lot of construction going on in Sugar House. We're going to add 1,000 units of housing in Sugar House. So if you think we have to add two Sugar Houses per year, for 25 years, as policymakers, we really need to be um, deliberate and, and focused on where are we going to put these people because we have built out all of the, basically, all of vacant land for housing. 
The last thing I want to say uh, about data, I suppose, is the, is the principle of public engagement, which is that people who are impacted by a decision have the right to a say in the outcome. And I tell you, I, was pro I, I will claim to be the most shocked person in the room when I saw Pam's data for the first time, that 70% of my constituents are Latino. And I never see them in a community council meeting, zero. Uh, well, maybe one, and she's sitting right over there. Uh, I'm faced with this dilemma, which is those who vote for me, those who elect Kyle Mapa to office, are not the ones who will be, who are participating in the decision making of neighborhoods. And to make the right decision for society could very well be at odds with the right decision for a political future. So anyway, I kind of want to let you know that this is, uh, that our, our political leaders need to grapple with this, these uh, difficult challenges in terms of making the decisions of what are right, what's right and versus who votes. And I'll leave it with that. Oh. Thank you, Pat. <clears throat> I think we're gonna follow Kyle and the, the local, that's a very powerful conclusion that really touches me very deeply. Um, we're going to shift a little bit to hear two very specific applications of this data. One is in the business sector, which Chris Redgrave will do for us, and then the second is in the nonprofit sector, which Karen Crompton will do for us. Chris? Oh, thank you. Um, well, when I think about the importance of data, I do a business program for uh, Zions Bank, and we're on 19 radio stations in Utah and Idaho, magazine, video, and getting ready to launch digital. And so when I think about the importance of data, so to put it in perspective, we meet with and, um, and basically interview, interface with seven businesses a week. So we create the feature that runs on the radio stations. The predominant one would be KSL Radio. And so we have to get that data and that information correctly because they have to sign off on a document saying that we can run this feature. So data is my life. I was a broadcaster for 20 years before going to Zines Bank. And in broadcasting, you're analyzed daily from a data standpoint. And now they have a digital application where they can actually download listenership on a daily basis. So um, I, I'm not a data diva like Dr. Perlick. I, I don't have that distinction, but I'm a data nerd. And so I love information. And when I think about the importance of data to a Zines Bank, I mean, if you understand compliance and banking, and then Dodd-Frank, um, <laughs> information and data and getting it accurately is critical for banking right now. Um, I, we do not basically make a decision at Zions Bank, I would say by and large for the most part, without some form of data. It's absolutely critical in what we do, and when you think about it, um, when you think about the importance of it, it's not just in, right now we have about 135, we used to call them branches, that's outdated, they're now called financial centers. So when you go to your financial center, it's not a branch, but anyway, we have about 135 of them across the state of Utah. And when you think about that, it's critically important that we understand the needs of that community before we just launch in with a branch. Um, I, I had an opportunity to go to a, uh, a banking conference yesterday with about 200 bankers, and they had some distinguished speakers there. And one of them, this was such a proud moment for me because she was talking about diversity in our marketplace and how fast it's expanding. And she recognized two banks um, for really embracing diversity in this marketplace and doing something about it for about the last 10 years, and Zions Bank was one of them. So it was a very proud moment for me, and I can, I can tell you that from a diversity standpoint, we have a division that is focused on the Hispanic population, we have a division that, uh, that's over women's financial group, we have a division that's focused on the millennials because of this uh, emerging, it's called the emerging market, it's a big, huge emerging market for us. We have a division that's forming right now that's focused on gay, lesbian, and transgender, Zions Bank is, I think, a little more hip than people may realize, and I'm, I'm very proud to be very proud to be a part of this financial institution. As far as our community connectedness, am I on the right track for you? Mm -hmm. As far as our community connectedness, that's a core value at Zions Bank, and uh, we use data to understand the importance and the need in our community before we donate the millions of dollars that we do every year. 
Um, this is the largest regional bank, and we're very proud of that. We're very proud of, in fact, when I was asked about our, our downtown connection, my, if I'm, my understanding is correct that we've basically been in the same location for, for about 140 years. So we've been downtown for 140 years. We are, down, we are daytime residents, and we also have a coalition of people that live in downtown. So our downtown is critically important to us, and our community connectedness is critical. Um, our small business footprint, when we think about small business designs bank, even though we're in um, a tower building as far as a corporate office, our business connectedness is to small business and to family business. We're talking mom and pops, brick and mortars. I look at them eye to eye every week, and I understand some of their challenges and their needs, and I see their hope and their desire. And so we're very connected to our small business uh, community, and it's a, it's a large part of who we do business with. Um, and so I think, I think that's it. I, I, I'll, I'll be excited about answering some questions, but um, I think, uh, is my two minutes up? Did I go long enough? Because I can certainly talk. Oh, am I good? <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for this distinction, and, and thank you so much, Doctor, for your information. I've had an opportunity to see you present Designs Bank, and I'm always very interested in your information, so thank you so much. But data to me from a business standpoint is critical in the decisions that we make in the communities that we support. Thank you. Kara. Thank you for inviting me to join you today. Um, Voices for Utah Children is a child advocacy organization, and our advocacy has always been based on data. So I, I'm really excited about the fact that we're focusing on the topic of data at a public forum like this. Um, I had someone tell me a few years back that uh, nobody ever marched over a pie chart, but I think the people in this room might. <laughs> so thank you for your interest in data. Uh, today, uh, we are also releasing our 2013 Kids Count Measurements of Child Well-Being Report. Kids Count, a project of the Annie E. Casey Foundation, is an initiative to track national, state, and county level data uh, about the well-being of children. By providing high quality data and trend analysis, Kids Count seeks to enrich that discussion about how we can secure better futures for all our children. Obviously, um, the opportunity to get down even below county data is a real exciting possibility for us, and we just see that as a way to enhance the work that we do on behalf of children and families. I would mention that for 18 years, we have been the Kids Count grantee in Utah. And this year's report uh, is available on our website. It contains 25 indicators of well-being for children uh, at the county level. So we're not down to the community level on this report. But we also uh, produced a poster this year that we highlight some of the critical indicators of child well-being in our state in the area of education, economics, economic security, health, and education. We've got some copies of the poster out on the table outside the doors here, so I, I hope you will literally carpe datum, seize a poster and take it with you just as a reminder of why kids count and what you can do to make sure kids count in policy discussions. You know, in Utah, kids are nearly a third of our population and certainly 100% of our future. You know, you've heard everyone say today that data can help policymakers and advocates identify problems and that require action and come up with solutions. As people in our state were looking at child death rates, they sat down to look at the data and what are the leading causes of child death rates and what can we do to lower that? Well, you've probably seen seatbelt campaigns, uh, the booster seat campaigns, hold on to dear life associated with primary children's medical center and it's changed for the better. We have better outcomes for kids. Uh, data can identify successful policies that should be continued or expanded. Think about graduated driver's licenses for teenagers or the most recent texting and cell phone bills that have passed. Also, as state and municipal resources become more limited, data can really help policymakers evaluate whether we are in effectively investing our taxpayer dollars to get the best return. One great example of that, there's considerable national data about the value of high quality preschool, particularly for at-risk kids. Uh, Dr. James Heckman, Nobel laureate economist and professor at the University of Chicago has done a lot of analysis that shows you know, a seven to 10% annual return on that investment. 
Well, national data is good, but you know it's always better when you got something local. So as we were looking for uh, where we could find something out about Utah preschool, which is kind of limited because we don't have universal preschool, uh, we worked with the Granite School District. <coughs> two reasons. One, they have a high quality preschool program, and two, they collect data. So we've been able to track uh, four cohorts of kids now from preschool through fifth grade and see them close the achievement gap, see them perform at or above their peers statewide. So again, make the case for effective investment. You know, as you've heard also today, policymakers want good data, but they don't always have what they need to do that. And that really is at the community level. I'll give you one example in the area of children's health uh, insurance coverage. There's nearly 100,000 kids in Utah who do not have health insurance. The majority of those are already eligible for CHIP or Medicaid, but not enrolled. While the uninsurance rate does vary greatly by um, income and race, it varies even more by community. If the state could identify where those children live at the community level, it would make it much easier to enroll them and certainly make outreach much more cost effective. The other problem with data, uh, even when we do have community level data, it's in silos. You know, it's in the <coughs> Medicaid or education database. We don't have a, a place where all that comes together. So even if there is the data and you want it, sometimes you have to go to a lot of places to find it. And then the measures of outcomes for communities continue to be scarce. Uh, today, most commonly discussed measures on economic security are the GDP, gross domestic product, and the poverty rate. But both those measures are really too limited and don't provide communities or policymakers or advocates uh, the data to understand what is really needed to achieve progress. We need indicators at the community level that help us measure economic opportunity and mobility so we can find the opportunities that are present in different communities. The places where people live are pivotal to the opportunities open to them. I mean, some of you have heard the phrase, zip code is your destiny. We need to find a way to change that. Neighborhoods and regions matter for employment, education, housing quality, law enforcement and public safety, and the community organizations that exist within there. Some communities have characteristics that open many windows of opportunities for their residents, but others do not. Uh, we're working on an initiative right now around intergenerational poverty. How do you get at that long-term solution uh, of <coughs> addressing intergenerational poverty? And we're targeting it in six zip codes in the state where the highest concentrations of intergenerational poverty exist with at least 1,000 kids in those zip codes. We're looking within those, which schools are there? What are the test scores in those schools? What are the graduation rates? What are the community opportunities that exist beyond that? And a, a whole range of factors. Uh, so again, data is critical. Again, I would just echo what everyone else has said. This is such an exciting project, and I hope it goes beyond Salt Lake City. Oh, I applaud Salt Lake City for being first on this, but it's really something that uh, we need across the state. So thank you, Pam. There's a, the, I mean, the, <clears throat> the support for this democratizing data is actually overwhelming. And um, I want to come back to the education question. I think Chris had one point that she'd like to add about education, and then we'll remind people about the question cards and take a little intermission. Chris, do you want to? I get so focused on business, I thought, wow, I'm going to miss a point of even being here. Uh, I want to talk about the fact that Zions Bank uh, has an uh, education reimbursement program, ongoing mentor and mentee programs, uh, job shadows with high schools. In fact, I just took a high school senior with me yesterday to the Utah Genius Luncheon. Uh, we support 2020 business initiative through embedding that information into our um, uh, our uh, nine radio stations here in Utah, and um, and so I'd be remiss if I if I didn't talk about that. So I just wanted to bring that up that that is an important and critical mission for Zions Bank. Thank you. Okay, so did, I think we're going to have a we're going to have a chance to come back to questions for the panel and for Pam and for you know, much more generally. So I want to ask you just one more time, one more reminder to send your questions to the 
women with the baskets. And if you're addressing a question to a particular panelist, could you please um, make a note of that person's name? Uh, we're going to take a quick intermission here, and then we're going to invite in Chris Kingsley and Catherine Pettit, who have been working at the national level with the National League of Cities and the National Neighborhood Indicators programs to kind of help us take a look at where and how this initiative fits in and, and coincides with some of the national efforts. So we'll take a quick 15 minute, a 10 minute break. Okay, thank you. And thanks for many thanks to our panelists. We'll hear from them again. We are very pleased, um, the second part of the program, to have um, the opportunity to connect with the National League of Cities. Chris Kingsley, who is a senior, and I'll, you can see that on the um, program here, the Principal Associate for Data Initiatives. Look, oh, where's Natalie? Can you see this, Natalie? <laughs> I'm using my glasses. Um, the principal, yeah, the multifocal, the principal associate for data initiatives with the National League of Cities. As was mentioned, um, Salt Lake City was selected one of five cities um, in the nation to participate in this uh, post-secondary access and success program where we receive technical assistance from them, technical assistance. And um, Chris is very instrumental in the whole data realm and we are going to, um, have a participation by him on a go to meeting as well as a colleague of him of his Catherine Pettit who is a senior research associate with the Urban Institute they will have opportunity to present to us and then we will follow up uh, respectively afterwards with another presentation from uh, Dr. Perlick so um, Chris take it away it is an awful lot of time for us to get to be in and visit you in Salt Lake City this way so thanks for, for being patient with us uh, thanks to the mayor
a resource um, to our members and communities in which we work. And I couldn't recommend it more highly as a resource to Dr. Carlos University as they work to get the youth out DNA data project up and running. So more about them in a few minutes, and Kathy will have a chance to share some more about her work. This morning's conversation, I think, is in a narrow sense about information. We've been talking about uh, data systems and uses of data. But I want us to reflect a bit from NLP's many engagements over the years with cities about how we think about the importance of community data systems and about uh, just a couple of the very important links between information and action. Um, and the first is the power of information, I think, catalyzes leadership. And I want to give you just a quick example um, that I hope will be relevant to some of the work we're doing there. Uh, for years, city leaders have worked very hard to try to improve high school gradu graduation rates, um, and still are, and it has some success. The, the national rate of last I saw was just shy of 80 percent nationally, it's still moving in the right direction. So more of our students are making it through the back doors of our high schools with a diploma in hand, which is, is great. Uh, we do know that a diploma by itself um, isn't the same kind of ticket to the middle class that it used to be, uh, and it isn't sufficient to meet the workforce needs. Uh, and that's something we hear from business groups in our chambers of commerce. So more recently, using oftentimes longitudinal data systems uh, from area universities, from the student sharing house, from the longitudinal systems that have grown up um, and become increasingly sophisticated at the state level, the field led by foundations in some cases, such as Bill and the Gates and the Lumina Foundation, began to look at what's happening with those students after they left the facility, after the high school, uh, and whether or not they made it into the front door of a trade school or a degree program, and ultimately uh, whether or not they graduated with some sort of credential. And the results have been sobering here. Uh, this is one example I'll talk about in just a moment. But while we found that most graduating high school students really do plan on attending uh, some kind of post-secondary education, first, a great many that will apply. Of those that apply and are accepted, uh, those that end up in the DC very critically don't make it out of the remedial program uh, in return in their second year. And so ultimately, a minority of students who enter college were finding completed. This is a, an example from Louisville here. When mayors and business leaders get information like this, in Louisville and anywhere, uh, they act, right? Uh, and so a data like this creates the, uh, the um, 55,000 degrees initiative, as they call it there, which is a multi sector partnership that's enlisted the whole community to try to bring 55,000 more post secondary degrees by the year 2020. So this is important data catalyzes action. The second point I just wanted to make was around the ways in which community based systems guide investment and allocation of resources. Uh, we know, and this is the point that I think we've come back to, that our communities aren't uniform, uh, either in their needs or their assets. And so, aggregate statistics of the type that we're talking around for either local or nationally can be misleading because most of our strategies for addressing student needs uh, or youth development don't operate on a, on a city scale. They operate at the scale of a neighborhood or at the scale of a school. Um, this was Dr. Carlos' point, I think. Which one program does not work in all areas of the community. And so funders and city council men certainly in this example uh, it's the Jacksonville Children's Commission on the screen here to be able to evaluate their impact and make decisions about how to allocate the resources to find that first they need to understand needs at a neighborhood level. So those red triangles on the screen, uh, assuming you can see them fairly clearly, uh, indicate schools in Jacksonville with a non-promotion rate of at least or around 10%, which is very high. They also need a bird's eye view of what they have to map their access. And this isn't the clearest case, but if you look at the areas that are shaded dark uh, on the map on the screen in front of you, um, those are areas that have very high uh, after school participation in the state. So they're areas that are saturated with programs. So this map has become one of the, the important pieces of an ongoing conversation between the Children's Commission and Jacksonville and the City Council about uh, what and where they fund programs, about how to prioritize, um, and, and whether they can demonstrate impact. You know, the careful decision making that the woman from prosperity is going to find that measure. So we should come back to this point about how uh, neighborhood based a lot of these questions are, and we can ask Kathy in particular about how chronic absenteeism rates in Oakland that vary around the schools, and for example, what, what that's meant in terms of how they understand the problem, what they propose to do about it. But the underlying uh, point here is that the role of data in understanding where our challenges and opportunities lie is, is really large. And as a community, if you're thinking back to the example of high school graduation and post secondary trajectory, um, and then having enough information to be able to evaluate what we think of as the story behind those statistics is crucial, and to direct our limited resources uh, with reasonable confidence that they really will have an impact. So, we're talking today about five community data systems. Uh, we're talking about a public resource. 
And the National League of Cities has had the opportunity to work pretty closely with elected leaders, um, with the United Way, in some cases with universities and others, to try to, to move the needle on different issues related to the, the well-being of youth, families, and communities. And it has been our experience that those communities that have a resource like the one being envisioned here in the Utah Community Data Project, um, those partnerships are often able to move much faster and much further than those without. Um, and so it's one of the reasons we're so grateful, uh, looking over to Kathy here, for what NMSE does uh, in working so closely with uh, 37 partners to try to strengthen these systems across the country. Um, and it's fun to think about what we mean uh, when we say community data system and what some of the defining characteristics have been uh, of those that have been most useful to the work of mayors and their partners. So I just want to offer three quick uh, principles here. One is that this infrastructure should, uh, in my view, generally not be project specific. You're talking about a, a fairly substantial investment in a resource that once built and served multiple purposes. So there's an issue of scale here. Uh, a lot of the work is in finding the administrative home, uh, gathering and cleaning and linking data sets from federal and local and other sources, creating some kind of interface to expose that in a, as a, a confidence that it's democratized data uh, for the whole community. So all of that work having been done, um, this is as likely to be a useful resource for researchers as it is for policymakers. It's as likely to be a resource for transportation planners as educators. That's not just one thing. Second principle is that while the development and the longer term sustainability of a system like this depends on the contribution and on the support of different ways of local leaders and the organizations that are, I think, probably in the room today, um, each of whom may, you know, right, rightfully have their own policy agendas, I think it's very important that the repository itself be located in a position of what we call data socialism. Um, so you've heard the joke that in God we trust all of us must bring data. Well, you want to be sure that at least the data is trustworthy, right? The company's point. And partly because that trust is so important and generally comes from the relationships that you have uh, you know, with the University of Utah in this case, with Dr. Perlich and her staff. Um, and the confidence that you have in their knowledge about the region, your region, in our experience, it's important that, uh, it's important that community data systems like this be locally owned and operated. So, Salt Lake City has uh, some peers who have taken some further steps down this path, and I'll just mention a couple briefly. One is the Providence Plan, which is an independent nonprofit, it's a partner to NIT, uh, located in Providence, that has integrated just a tremendous amount of information across health and human services and education and the workforce at this point. Um, they're a core member of Providence's Children Youth uh, Council. They produce a, a whole set of these interactive data stories, one of which is on the screen here, to introduce policymakers and others to issues related to things like uh, chronic absenteeism, substance abuse, and, and other things, and I'd recommend you take a look at them. And they played a really key role in the state's successful application to the federal and federal government grant, too including both uh, the first two raised the top grant, which is what Adam was successful in. Second example is Philadelphia's policy, uh, policy analysis center, which is a slightly different model. This was a system that had moved from uh, being a very sophisticated research database within a university setting, used mostly by academic researchers um, at the University of Pennsylvania, now in City Hall, where it's been adopted by uh, the mayor's office and the health department, where they're setting uh, to a large degree the research agenda and getting information which is uh, more directly relevant, therefore, to uh, the policy decisions they have in the past. And then finally, uh, San Francisco has uh, been doing a lot of data integration of administrative records on clients across mental health, child welfare services, and juvenile justice to get a better sense of what the risk and protective factors are for these kids. Um, and to help educators and, and caseworkers be able to intervene earlier and also more effectively when this multi-system perspective uh, to looking at kids' well-being is a case could be trouble. So we published a recent article from which the snapshot was taken to the Kennedy Center just recently. So all of this points to, uh, I think, increasing capacity in a lot of these community data systems, which from our perspective as the National League of Cities is tremendous. Um, and I'll make the point that precisely how that develops and what it's used for has everything to do with your vision and your priorities locally, right? So in closing, I just wanted to say again uh, how excited we are about the Capital City Education Initiative and the great work that the mayor and staff and partners are leading around the issue too of uh, student post-secondary success. We think it's an important issue. You know, really good to be working with you on it. I would expect that the Utah Community Data Project would be a strong support of that work, um, just as community data systems have been in Providence and other communities. 
And I trust that as NLP can be useful for you, uh, please do reach out to us. We help facilitate a municipal data network, which is a conversation among a couple of dozen cities working on these same kinds of opportunities. But I, I think among your strongest allies in doing this work is the Urban Institute Network, the Penn NIT, who we regularly turn as a resource. So I want to introduce our next speaker, Kathy Pettit. I've mentioned uh, that Kathy directs the National Labor Indicators Partnership. The collaborative of, at this point, 37 local partners to further the development and the use of neighborhood level information systems in local policy making uh, and community building. She's also a recognized expert on local and national data systems useful in housing and urban development research and program development, and a senior research associate in the Metropolitan Housing and Community Policy Center at the Urban Institute. So we may need to do just a little bit of shifting around in our piece here. So, uh, Kathy, thanks for being with us and thanks for presenting today. Great, thanks. Great, I wanted to um, add my thanks for including us in this exciting day, although I think um, visiting your city would be more fun than doing it from the office here, um, even though it is a beautiful day. Um, I think Chris gave a good background, and I, the Urban Institute is a policy research organization here in D.C., and, then, and I um, directed the Help direct the NIT network as our um, acronym, um, as we explain the acronym for the um, past two years. So we started in 1995 with uh, six original partners, and what the partners all had in common is that they build and operate neighborhood level information systems using local data. And there's really three components that we think is a really um, that for their success, really uh, related to school and no one is enough, but they have really trusted and engaged institutions on the ground. They have a um, set of really rigorous um, and relevant data, and they have a mission to specifically use this data for local action, um, not um, only academic or um, uh, for a report to them. So so I think uh, Chris luckily covered most of my points. We've grown from six to 37 partners um, to today, and we have about 10 others that we're working with. The partners are housed in different types of institutions, universities, nonprofits, local funders, but whatever the home, they're all respected with a really long-term stake in their community. So they're not tied to one political agenda or issue area, they're really seen as, as neutral. Um, the data providers can be confident that the confidential data is handled properly, and the audience are confident of the rigor of the analysis. So, from both perspectives, um, they you know they are, uh, are they're respected from the both both ends of the data supply and demand, and they also are really on the ground to be responsive to community needs as they come up. If um, something comes up in council or or there's a um, Rack of um, student violence that they're there with the data to um, start to help you problem solve. So together, our 32 partners are just an amazing network of individuals for peer learning. There's a really rich base of knowledge to draw from. It allows new partners or existing partners tackling new issues to really get a jump start from others' past experience. So um, I'm really excited about both us learning from the work that you're doing and you learning from um, other work that our partners have done. So, in addition to the institutions, obviously, NIT couldn't exist without the local data. Um, and the local data is more important than ever as the census has switched from the long form every 10 years to the five year averages and less precise American community survey. So, more and more for current information, we're really relying on the admin data. The partners, so they go to the police department, the health department, the school department, negotiate long term agreements, and collect the data, clean it up. Um, and then push out um, relevant neighborhood level indicators for common use. And I think um, I've been mentioned a couple of times how important neighborhood level is about being able to see where the problems are in your community and start to craft solutions. The other piece is that, um, that we think it's really important to cover uh, the multiple, you know, the full range of issues because residents don't really live in silos. They don't think about um, you know, high quality schools and safe streets and clean water as separate pieces. It's just the neighborhood of where they live. And the solutions won't be silos either um, once you get into the um, looking at the different issues. So the result of this data work is really a one stop shop that's a flexible resource for the whole community. So it's much more cost effective than each nonprofit group um, trying to do it themselves or government agencies. Um, Sharing off on a one off basis among themselves is really an economy of scale. And I won't, um, I'm a data person and 
funders and the data providers to grow and support the systems over time. Um, but they, I can guarantee that there is a great return on investment um, across the community. So the third part, so we had, uh, we have fantastic innovative institutions, we have um, rigorous data, and the last part is really um, our motivation for doing this, our principles, our values. This is, um, this is why we do the fronting, whether it's for policy making, community building, program planning, advocacy, and really the, the founding and IT partners got started because they saw that not everyone had access to the information. So the focus started on getting data and helping low-income communities use data um, since they traditionally had been shut out of, of, the, um, of access to it before. But as the, both the organizations and the cities matured, they found that MIT partners also were needed to help citywide nonprofits, um, government agencies, uh, private businesses looking to invest, all use the data in their work. So it does serve multiple audiences and purposes. And some of the most compelling stories we have are where data has been used to break down silos among um, government agencies, among sectors, um, different geographic levels of government. Data brings people to the table to develop a common understanding of the issues and new solutions emerge. And one um, great example is our school readiness prospect project that we completed a couple of years ago. And our local partners brought together all of the stakeholders that touch um, our young children, healthcare providers, daycare, public schools, advocates, family support services, and these are really just a um, scattered array of organizations that were trying to um, intervene and, and um, help child development. But our partners gathered some initial indicators, new indicators about the young children in the community and really brought everyone to the same table to start talking about how to improve outcomes for the kids together um, and how to um, all pull in the same direction. So our partners have three main roles in the community, so there's enough of what they do every day. One is to assemble and disseminate the data, and I think the new um, system that will be demoed after we talk is a great example of um, just um, seeing the data and, and getting it out to be used. But that's really not enough, and you need to uh, have people on the ground who work side by side with others in the community. Um, I think Chris already mentioned about assessing and prioritizing the community needs. We hear all across the country there's increasing need and fewer resources. So, you know, how, how are you going to prioritize for that and target where that money goes? Uh, many of our partners also have been very competitive in federal grants, like the Promised Neighborhoods and Sustainable Communities, I'll give examples of in a minute. So, with this data infrastructure in place, a community can more easily um, pull together on the tight time frame of a grant application, the need for the program, the ability to have a data-driven um, implementation and evaluate success. So it puts you, you know, a leg up among the other competitors. And finally, our, um, the last piece on the application side, our, many of our partners have comprehensive community pro uh, indicated projects like the Boston Foundation or Vital Science in Baltimore that really do a um, once a year, once every two year review of um, of the, of the various issues in the community to have that larger discussion rather than, than project by project. And then finally, um, beyond these um, individual impacts we're talking about, we really do have a broader agenda to change the culture of the city to improve the ability of all sectors to access and use data, to raise expectations about um, the access to quality information for investment decisions that you all are making every day. So I'm going to move to just a few examples. Um, this first one is from Memphis and um, our partner at the university there. And the, the common assumption was that the properties with the worst flight would also be those in foreclosure, those in red here. I'm not sure how the color is showing up on your screen. Um, and the city was planning their code enforcement strategy with that in mind, that putting the, the foreclosure one first. But our, um, our NIT partner designed a survey on property conditions and trained students and neighborhood residents to collect the information for each home in this pilot neighborhood. The map shows the overlay of the resulting data, so the hat, the, um, the hat the parcels are the blighted ones, and the aqua ones show vacant or abandoned homes. And you can see that many of the blighted and vacant homes, actually most of them, are not in foreclosure. So really the strategy of the city would have missed some of the, you know, um, the worst homes. 
homes in these neighborhoods. So the next example is from our um, neighborhood, but you see um, a partner house um, at the Urban Institute. They are the data partner for the Thomas Neighborhood Initiative, and they've um, won the Department of Ed grant. Um, so one of their key goals is quality, high quality early education. So um, as as quick example, they really need to know what's there first. Um, they did learn, you know, the total capacity of 22 infants and 102 older children in spots. So they found where and what kind and a general quality estimate. But the admin data, once again, um, was a great start, but not enough. They're now moving to qualitative methods around um, surveys, focus groups, what parents want, how strong are the curriculum in these um, center based programs, what other programs to support families they need. One more example from um, Kansas City. Our partner there is the Mid Atlantic Regional Council, and um, they are a sustainable community grantee. Um, to the partnership between the Department of Transportation, Environment, and HUD and Housing um, here federally, and this um, their initiative for is a main state initiative. They chose six commercial corridors to revitalize and fight expansion improvement. And this is just they're a fantastic example of really integrating regional and local perspectives. So scanning the region, but, but working locally. This is from their implementation guidebook that I really recommend. It identifies indicators and outcomes for different pieces of their initiative. And it reflects a broader trend on emphasis of, um, of measuring outcomes and really um, demonstrating impact um, that is required by more and more funders. So this um, last example of go into a little more depth and I'll give credit to the Urban Strategy Council, that's our partner in Oakland and Steve Spiker who put these slides together. Um, absenteeism is related directly to academic performance, obviously. If kids are not in school, they can't learn. Um, it's also really connected to late graduation and dropping out all together. And it's, it's a perfect issue for NIT partners to be involved in because there's a variety of both immediate reasons for kids not attending, um, that health, on the life of transportation, life of Healthcare for younger siblings, but also structural factors like poverty, family relationships with the school, um, school attendance policies. So it really requires a broader perspective to start addressing the problem. So here's the first slide. Um, so um, understanding the problem is the first piece, and who really is affected. So this shows that about 9% of the kids in Oakland were chronically absent. That means missing 10% or more of the school days. And you can see that African Americans have um, about twice the average rate, and so do children uh, who are in special So the idea that you might even target a program for these groups in particular um, came out of this graph. The next one is really understanding the um, sort of the degree of severity, and this breaks it down by both grade level around uh, across the columns and then um, the rows, the greater than 20%, if I could highlight that. So this shows that 22 schools of the, um, in the Oakland School District had more than 20% of their kids missing more than 10% of the school year in 2009-2010. And really, the severity of the problem really um, moved people to action. And I think the other thing to point out is there's been a real emphasis in the um, and the chronic absenteeism workshop focusing on elementary school also. We hear a lot about truancy programs in, um, in high school, but to catch it early and do some early detection, pay attention to excuse as well as unexcused absences um, is really the way we think you can start to tackle the problem. And here's a map. Um, it's just a share of chronically absent elementary school students by census tract of where the student lives. So what this requires is to get the individual school record um, and this is not by school location, um, as added up um, with confidentiality protections and produce these indicators. So you can show this um, cluster up in the north um, of the street, more than 20% of those kids are chronically absent, and also this one um, isolated neighborhood in the south. So the root of the problem is definitely going to differ neighborhood by neighborhood, and by understanding where the problem is, you can start to tailor the intervention to fit the context, along with the, all the other data are made with um, info, are made with the data that has. And here's an example of sort of moving it from that data, the relevant part of the high quality data. So you can have a really high quality um, data set locked up in a, in a computer, but what this is, and the, the details of the numbers don't matter, but this shows the percent of kids attending 90% or more of the scheduled school days week by week. And um, for each school, which is blocked out here, um, and there's a color code if you fall behind. 
time at a specific threshold. So this is a tool for principals and the central office to monitor things as they go along. And when they, they did this the first year, they found out that even six weeks into the school year, 12% of African-American students had already missed 10% of the scheduled school days. So rather than wait till May to figure out if you have a problem, like let's start to intervene um, in October when you can see it um, coming on right away. And then the, um, the last slide um, is just to talk about what their action steps were. And this, this work is an ongoing, um, obviously this is a large problem, they're not gonna solve overnight. But once they got to dig in, once the school district was willing to share their data, they could really start to have a conversation about data quality and collection, um, which hadn't been used before. The review of uh, data, as the school I mentioned. Um, so develop a culture of attendance in the school system. You know, you expect the kids to, um, to come to school and share that, but it's not just a school problem. So you need to engage parents and students and partner with nonprofits to address some of those barriers that I talked about. So in this case, our MIT partner provided the neutral data that um, people um, thought that the school system might have um, some motivation to, um, to tweak the data or to put a slant if you want it. So this came from a really trusted source. They had a policy background about what to do about it, and they have a connection to the community and really um, that respect of the, um, both the residents and the organizations start this conversation about how to tackle absenteeism in their city. So I just wanted to um, let you know about our website, that um, it's neighborhoodindicators.org, which I realized I forgot to put the actual URL on the slide, um, but hopefully you can find it through Google also. And in particular, um, it shows um, data of our partners and about the general NIT model, but also um, for those of you in the room, one of the um, easiest way to get into things is through our issue areas page where you can dig in and see the work that our partners have done over the years on um, on a whole range of different issues. So thanks again for including us. I'm really excited about the work you're doing in Salt Lake City. It sounds like you have the right people at the table and the right principles, the right direction to really um, have a lot of momentum and um, improving the use of both specific programs like the Capital City Education Campaign, but using that as a springboard for um, more rigor, you know, a more um, uh, inclusive community and patient infrastructure across the city. So I'll put the um, resources of NIT at your disposal as the community project grows over the next um, few months, and I'm excited to see where you guys, um, how you guys develop. Yes, and we're running a little behind schedule, so thank you so much for joining us. All right. Can you hear me now? Okay. We're running behind schedule, so we'll have our big closer now. Okay, so this is the Utah Community Data Project. We're just getting started. We have some basic seed funding. We have a technical team that has built. We have a real IT people, actually, who have built. Uh, we have system administrators, uh, database programmers, uh, web developers, econometricians, statisticians, demographers, economists, geographers, the Digit Lab. Could the technical team please stand and so I can show you guys off? <laughs> so not everybody's here, but this is a, a, a good cross-section of our team. They've been terrific to work with, but we're just, this is just the beginning, uh, if you didn't get that. We have just enough to get up and going, and so today we're going to show you a little bit of what we've done, and I'm very aware of the time today, so I'll go quickly. Our first really big project out of the box is the 2010 Census Atlas. I understand John Downen has a Sharpie in his pocket. If anybody would like to have an autograph, he's available. Uh, and very quickly, um, just to let you know, uh, this is by Salt Lake uh, City uh, Council Districts. And so you see in the River District, this is the number of people. These are just some excerpts from the Atlas. Uh, then you can see about four out of 10 preschoolers is in the River District. 
Uh, nearly half of all the uh, school age population of the cities in the River District. You can see where the college age population is concentrated in the city. You can see where the old folks are. Uh, you can see where the Hispanic population is in the city. Uh, the share of, the, so 65% of the Salt Lake City Hispanic population is in the River District. This is total minority population. Uh, these are minority shares of the population. So this is minority majority in both districts one and two. The share of the city's minority population, uh, again, approaching 60% of all minorities live in the River District. Also, these are, the fa these are heavily family communities. So you've got young families with lots of kids. Over here, you've got non-family households and small households. Then you also can see the group quarters populations. The, a lot of these are the homeless shelters. Um, and so this just be, is the uh, very bare bones basic uh, beginning of our Utah Community Data Project. And I'd like to show you now a little bit about our website. And so here we are. We're going to take a very rapid tour. So this is what you see when you go to the Utah Community Data Project. First of all, we'll go by location, and we will look at some political districts. And the first one we'll look at, and see these are static reports. This is Senate District 1 in the River District, Senator Robles. These are available in PDF, but eventually we'll do stuff on the fly with a bunch of uh, interactive graphics, the capability to cross-tab and overlay data, uh, this, as I say, is just a start. Uh, this will allow people to have routinely needed data. In this case, we were trying out a variety of software approaches, a variety of technical approaches to how to create these programmatically generated uh, reports. In this case, this one's available for every politician's district in the state, the, the legislature and our congressional people. Here you see the population pyramid in the River District. And you can see that fat bottom, that's big families. Look to the left there, very, uh, that we have many more Hispanics in this district, in Senator Robles' district. Uh, let's poke around just a little bit more here. Um, and now we'll see uh, the House District 23. This is Representative Selig's district. And again, this is just an example of the types of data we'll look at. This is just a start for us. And in the end, we want to be dynamic, where you have the ability to create your own graphics and explore the data in your own way. But we also want to create uh, commonly required data that people need that are helpful to people, think, things that there are routinely produced uh, so that uh, it meets the needs of a variety of uh, populations and groups. Now this is uh, 2010 data. Uh, again, as a big part of our program, we want to build post sensual estimates at the small area level for people, households, and housing units, meaning 2011, 2012, 2013. We have ambitions, yes, to get into the projection business. Uh, and so let's look again at another uh, political district profile here again in the River District. This is Representative Romero. Uh, Representative Romero then, we can see in this data again a very young population and very racially and ethnically diverse. You see here on the far right, for comparison, you've got state data so that you can see that in this case, the Hispanic share is much larger in the district than it is in the state. We prepared the table data for details, but the real power here you see is in the visualization of the data. Here, a classic immigrant community with many young adults, their children, and not many elders. Again, much racial and ethnic and cultural um, diversity. Well, um, maybe we should look at a place with not, which is much less racially and ethnically diverse. Uh, and maybe we could find a Republican, but not in Salt Lake City. Uh, let's uh, look at uh, uh, Representative Arendt's Cottonwood Heights, Heights uh, district here. And you'll see that it is much older and is much, well, old, a lot of old white people, okay? Um, and uh, you can see fewer school kids, a much larger presence of people 65 years and older, and very uh, disproportionately white, not Hispanic, non-minority. 
But again, the tables of number only do so much for you. And what we want to develop are a whole range of data visualizations. You see the fat top on this? That's lots of old folks. That's an older population. Uh, and you know, a big part of the value added of what we want to do is to prepare data visualizations to help people mine data and understand data. We want to write the stories that go with, these, with this data and these pictures. We want to give meaning to the combinations of these different uh, metrics. So here we decided we'd have to go out south. We're in Sandy now uh, to find a Republican, Representative Brown. Uh, and so you can see there again uh, a more uh, sort of stereotypic Utah race ethnic profile. And again, you can't see it from the table of numbers, but if we, once we look at the, uh, the population pyramid, you can see it is much, it's a population with a lot of uh, middle-aged and older uh, people, and there are their kids, not very many young kids. Um, this is Sandy. Okay, again, this is a static offering for what we will be producing dynamically. The visualizations, the mapping, uh, the graphics will, will be done um, on the fly eventually and across many other types of data. Uh, let's take a minute here and look at some data. This is another um, example of data we can pr uh, prepare routinely. Uh, this particular one uh, is that I'm going to show you here at, in Salt Lake County. Let's go down to Salt Lake City. And it's, again, programmatically generated out of databases. So uh, the program goes in, digs the data out of the database, and then puts it into this report. And this is one that's re required um, annually uh, for the Fair Housing Equity Assessment. Uh, we envision having a lot of housing data and a lot of health data, and again, producing reports that are required for administrative purposes, like CDBG funding or HUD funding. And that's where the content of this report comes from, so that any place in the state could get this. And you see in Salt Lake City, notice, uh, white, not Hispanic population has declined. Uh, all of the increase in the population in Salt Lake City has come from increases in minority populations. But this particular report, then, is for that purpose. So ta let's take a look at some of the mapping uh, functionality, which is just in its infancy here. Um, and so you can see um, that uh, we're able to, uh, well, right now uh, we're in San Pete County, uh, which is just south of the metropolitan area. You can see that it's highlighted. And depending upon the layers that you pick, then, and you can mouse over the, the, uh, the pie and get data. Uh, we have currently on this website more pies than Marie Callender. That's definitely true. <laughs> okay, well, look, there's... Uh, there's San Pete County. Look at the, the uh, Snow College people, and look how many more uh, female students we have in, in uh, Snow College than male students. So, uh, young men, if you're selecting um, a place to go to school, the odds are in your favor at Snow College. Uh, but the point is, we have these available. The, this particular report, then, is done in a different software and on a different platform and connected to the mapping. Um, and it's available down eventually to the block level. See, now we are going to uh, search up there in the window. There's Salt Lake County. It automatically zooms to Salt Lake County. Well, let's check out some smaller level geography. First, let's see what happens when we turn on all of these layers. So we're just sequentially putting, turning on the layers. It's a subtle difference as you turn them on that you're getting uh, variation in colors as they stack on top of one another. And this makes the viewing of the data in that little data window that I showed you um, available to you when you drill down to uh, the geography. So let's fly on down to that census tract. Does anybody know what that census tract is right there? Total population 3840. A lot of racial and ethnic diversity. There we can see the Hispanic data. And we can scroll through the different beta, data there, other races, Pacific Islander population, black population, a lot of black African Americans in this uh, census tract. A uh, very, very diverse census tract there in southern Salt Lake County. Does anybody know where it is? That's the prison, yeah. Uh, it's one of our most um, ethnically diverse census tracts. That's sad to say, isn't it? 
But you see if you mouse over the slices, you get the data. And then you have the opportunity also to get the, the report Ag again. Uh, this is just, we're just working with Salt Lake, we're just using 2010 census data here, the barest of demographics. Can you see the male prison population in that population pyramid? Um, and so, you know, people wouldn't necessarily know if they come across a pyramid, uh, you know, what does this mean? What's it showing me? So we, again, want to write reports and provide um, explanations for uh, what's going on communities. We want to write pr community profiles so that people know what the data means. But you can use this as a data mining tool uh, to find where, to discover where populations are really very different. Again, we want housing data, health data, education data, and all of the, uh, the rich uh, detail that we do get from Census 2010. We want to create estimates going forward for 2011 and 12 and 13. All right, now we're moving north in the county. In fact, we're moving north and east in the county. And what, we got quite a bit of racial and ethnic diversity here. In fact, look at that. The Asian population is 22% of the population. This is one of the few census tracts in the state where Asians are in such high proportion. And look at that age distribution. You know where we are? University of Utah. So you can see the student population, and some of them are having babies, as you can see. Not very many old folks in those dorms. Um, and so, uh, again, imagine the cross-tabulation uh, cross of metrics like uh, housing metrics, housing characteristics, uh, what about uh, uh, transportation, our, our track system, where is the affordable housing within say a mile of tracks, um, that's one um, housing and neighborhood development people in Salt Lake City are interested in. Here's another census tract. Uh, this one, uh, we are in the Glendale area, the south part of Glendale, and see that big fat pyramid on the bottom? Those are lots of young families. This is southern part, um, and very racially and ethnically diverse. Um, as you can see, 58% Hispanic. Um, let's see, let's explore the Glendale North neighborhood and see what that looks like. There you have a much more of an immigrant uh, community, you can see, because there aren't any old people. And the asymmetry in the male side of the pyramid shows you men that are here working, maybe, and haven't brought their families yet. Very racially and ethnically a diverse population. So 80% of the minorities in that area are Hispanics. And now let's put in a, an address, and Rosie will recognize this as the address of the new Heartland Partnership Center. And if you put that in the search window, you can zoom right to that area, and then you can look again at the data specific. We're at the block level now. So uh, blocks are the smallest level of geography available in the census. Look at that. Uh, lots of kids and lots of young men and hardly any old folks. This is an immigrant neighborhood. That is a signature uh, population pyramid of an immigrant community. And again, Hispanics are the majority of uh, the minority population, but you see a large presence of others as well. Okay, so you can... Open it up so you can see street layers, and the lower you zoom down, you can see where we're zooming to. Well, we are zooming to the Mountain View uh, Elementary School, and, we're, and this is also the, where the Community Learning Center is. Uh, and let's see, we've also got Glendale Middle School. And then we can display the data. Again, this is at the block level. It's the smallest level of geography that we have. Um, and so, again, this is just a start for us, but it's a big day for us because every long journey begins with one step. We feel we're at the beginning of the journey. The best is yet to come. Now the real work begins building partnerships and building out our system. Uh, and we hope that you'll join us in our effort to both uh, look at the data, come up with data, carpe datum, uh, and help us build out our system over time and watch us grow and be part of it. So we want it to be a meaningful community. Uh, 
a platform to build community. We want people to be able to upload data to it. We want to make meaningful contributions to the understanding of our new people and our new populations and how we change over time. This is the Utah Community Data Project. Carpe datum. <laughs> And we are about out of time. We have three minutes for uh, Judith to say something, uh, Judith or Rosie or who wants the last word to say something? Just a big closer, Judith. Uh, it's the lag time. There, we had a series of questions that came in and they were kind of in three general categories. One category was around where is all this data going to come from? Who is it coming to? And what are the privacy protections around that data? So there were a lot of questions, Pam, or two or three questions that were in that category. There was sort of another category that had to do with the politics of data. You know, some of this is coming to or from government sources. It's going to be used in different kinds of formats. What can be done in this Utah Community Data Project to protect the integrity of the data to make sure that it's legitimate and not spin data? There was a third category of questions that had to do with um, kind of next steps. You know, where is the money coming to? Who's going to have access? What kind of access? Um, what is the time frame? What are the funding requirements to really make this up and running and viable? And what are the sustainability requirements? So these are big questions. They're not, they're not simple questions. I'm not sure how we want to wrap that. I mean, one, there may be I'm wondering if there's some questions that people want to respond to quickly in that arena, and then we might also be able to do like some online posting with responses to the questions. But yeah. Kyle? Uh, I'll take the, well, I'll, I can take the political question. I, I wonder, could you, could you read, sort of read one of them, and, or a couple of them, and maybe get a little more flavor? Much administrative data comes through government agencies. With government comes a linkage to politics. As data comes to decision makers, how do we protect that it is complete data and not just spin data? How do we better educate legislators about data and related issues? Okay, spin data. I, 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 how to better educate um, legislators, I'll leave that to you guys. Um, that, totally, that could be a concern. Some, um, some data is, we just have to trust that it's apolitical. The census, I suppose, is one of those pieces of information that if we, if we don't believe in the census, then um, we're in bad shape. Uh, but other kinds of administrative data that, that the city is producing, I, by its nature, y you may think it's apolitical, or, or you may, you may um, have reason to believe it's apolitical. What I'm talking about are business licenses or um, building permits, or crime uh, reports, or crime incidents. On the one hand, it's apolitical in the sense that those are, we have a systematic process, we collect those the same way, and whether somebody comes into the office um, and has a big project or a small project, that is apolitical. On the other hand, I, I suppose it could be political in that different administrations pr uh, approach solving problems in different ways. And if, uh, if an administration or a set of legislators uh, chooses to enact some policy or some program that focuses in one area or another, maybe we will see changes in that administrative data that are systemic. Uh, maybe they're good, maybe they're bad, but they're the changes that we would see would be driven by some policy choice. Um, and as long as there's transparency there, I think that's okay. Um, but we do, we, do, we do need these administrative data, su data sets to support our decision making. And, and, and we need to treat them as though then what they are is an artifact of some political process or some um, governmental process. And as artifacts, um, with a process around them, it's absolutely critical to have experts uh, like the folks sitting over here who not, not only understand 
uh, the numbers that are produced out of the data, but the context of the production of that information, the metadata, as it's called, and, uh, and they're able to describe what it, that information means and not just um, looking at the numbers. I'll leave it at that. Mikkel, would you or Karen like to comment on this question about the legislature? So um, we're, we're often frustrated that pieces of legislation are initiated from anecdotal stories rather than data. And then when you provide data, it's, well, that's not the data we wanted. Um, so uh, for us, it's very helpful to be able to have additional ways to connect uh, real data with other data sources beyond what sometimes people believe is self-serving. I, 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 I get the politicizing of, of potentially some very simple pieces of data, which is how many young people are actually uh, able to read. That ought not be politicized. But currently, uh, there is a, a movement that essentially says, well, you're not making changes fast enough, so let's pull the resources. Okay, that makes a lot of sense, right? If usually you have the data to be able to inform where to put resources, not to pull them. So that's how data sometimes gets misused for an agenda. And I think our goal and our purpose has to be to be able to be clear enough about what the data is to be able to then inform one another and help each other find blind spots so that we can leverage services. Well, I'm somewhat encouraged by the d interest in the legislature in using good data. Um, last year, Senator Stuart Reed up in Ogden passed the Intergenerational Poverty uh, Mitigation Act, which doesn't end poverty, but it did require that the state collect and publish the information on intergenerational poverty and use data to create evidence-based policy. So I, I mean we were pretty refreshed that someone actually put that language into statute. Now we'll see how it all plays out over time, but I, I think that's a real encouraging piece and we always have to have the data, but you also have to have the story to tell the, to make the data come to life. As I said in my opening remarks, nobody marched over a pie chart. If we want people to march on stuff, we need the data and we need the story. I, I think I know we're out of we're just about out of the time that we had agreed to spend together today But I'd like to give Pam a chance to answer those three big questions that have to do with the way forward in terms of getting access funding and sustainability um, And then we'll have Rosie make some closing remarks Yes, I'm very um, cognizant of that. We are on borrowed time here so how do you motivate people to make financial uh, contributions to a system that we are advertising as being free and available? Everybody wants to come in and, and consume and their free lunch. So how do we motivate people to invest? See, this is a community resource. That's our catch-22 right now. And that's what we're trying to deal with because the reality is we could make this a pay-for-play system, right? The first people to us, we give them our love and we give them our analysis. Uh, but we don't want that to be the case. We want this to be a public good. That's essential to our vision. So right now we're in conversations with a lot of people. We're not sure exactly how it's going to happen. How quickly can we build out? Will it be sustained? To be determined. So we don't know. What we have is we have a proof of concept that we have a very able, talented, extraordinarily an extraordinarily gifted and I might add fun group of people to work with that, to make this possible. We have a vision for it. We've built networks of, of friends on the data side. We'd like to build this system for you. We don't know how we're going to fund it. We have at this point done a lot of it with volunteer label. The, the good graces the, the, uh, uh, has been subsidized by people who are willing to let their staff work on it as part of their, their uh, normal jobs like the IT group and like the Bureau, we do have some initial funding, but not a lot. So the answer is, we don't know. It's up to the community to see if it happens or not, uh, how the funding is going to come through. If we get a nice mother load of money, then we will just get busy and we will just build and we will ask you what you need and we will build it to help you make better decisions. Well, I want to say thank you to everybody for coming and, and also for our time that we're over. I, I guess one point I also want to make is we often think about um, collecting this data as a way to really identify what our, our needs are in a community and for planning purposes. I, 
I'd like to say that I've also found it very um, important to identifying our assets in the community. Um, we look at um, our diverse populations and we t sometimes think about that as a need area, but in fact we have multiple resources there. The majority of those populations are multilingual. Um, many come with degrees from foreign countries. Um, and once we begin to have accurate information, we can actually see where our assets are in a community and we can begin to overlay that um, with where resources are, where resources are needed, and truly identify where the gaps are. Um, I worked with the South Sudanese Association recently, and they were very interested in how they were going to be able to get more services for youth in their community. Uh, we were fortunate with, with some students to go into a, the Sudanese Community Association and find out that they actually had a database that they were collecting where their community lived. So we were be able to map that and we were also able to map where all the youth programs were in the areas where their families were living. And in fact, the majority of those families had within walking distance or short bus routes youth programs available that they were not aware of. Um, so being able to really think about where are our resources, how do they match up with our populations, what are new populations bringing in terms of strengths to our community is a valuable contribution to all of this data collection. Um, for next steps, one of the things that we'd like to do is we're going to be putting out a survey to all of you. We've collected your emails and we hope that um, you've put those and if not, if you'd like to continue to be part of this process, we encourage you to do that. In that survey, we're going to re-ask you to answer some of the questions of how w what would be your role in this? Do you are you a consumer of data? If so, what kind of data do you need? Um, could you be a provider of data? So there's a whole lot of information that we can gather that sort of doesn't cost funds right now. We can really think about what's already being collected, where is it at, how are we connecting to it, if that's an interest. And before we start building, what are the needs of the people in the communities that we have in order to build something that really does address those needs. So that survey will be coming out to you and we will also take advantage of an online format to answer some of these questions in more detail. Um, I think the other thing we wanted to do today was this is the beginning of a conversation. We're trying to build awareness of the importance of this. Um, Salt Lake City School District did not, was not able to get that $20 million grant, but was so close, 14 points, 14 points. And we've seen this happen and probably many of your nonprofits and other organizations have seen this happen where you have been very close, but you've not had the data that you've needed in order to bring the resources in this community. Salt Lake City um, suffers from a lot of stereotypes. Um, and as we compete against large urban areas, we have to be uh, the leaders and proactive in telling the stories of our cities. And those are very diverse stories with multiple needs, and so, um, but also multiple assets and strengths that we build. So. That's what we're trying to do here is begin that conversation, really up the awareness of getting that conversation going across our institutions in the city and begin to think about how we bring our resources together to be able to tell better stories for Salt Lake. Uh, thank you again to the conference organizers. I want to recognize one more time Darius Lee who organized this conference. Multiple interns in Poonam, I don't know if she's still here, but anybody else who um, helped to organize this conference, please stand and be recognized. Alliance team members, please. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it.